ඉතින් නේද අපි නැවත් වේ any questions up to this point no questions okay then shall we uh, start with this one 27 year old female presented with fever and cough for 3 days she was pale had ecchymotic patches on the extensor surfaces of the arm full blood count results pancytopenia ran neither bone marrow biopsy revealed the bone marrow replaced with fat and lack of progenitor cells staining with fish did not reveal any features of hematological malignancy so what's the diagnosis a plastic anemia yeah very correct once you see the pancytopenia and once you see that the bone marrow is fat that is nothing but a plastic anemia so why did she get fever and cough maybe because of leukopenia and some degree of immunosuppression uh then uh yeah w- what is the what is the classic presentation of aplastic anemia we know it comes with pancytopenia but what's the classic manifestation that's uh skin bleeding or petty uh, ecchymotic patches bruising okay so most of the time if someone comes with bruising etc and you find a pancytopenia you're probably dealing with a aplastic anemia it could be any other cause but if you take 100 patients with aplastic anemia most of them would have presented with bruising in the first place and very soon they will catch an infection which might be the event that brings them to the hospital okay right uh why is it not hemophagocytosis following infection have you all heard of hemophagocytosis probably not i don't think you need to know much about it uh sometimes after an infection people develop an abnormal macrophage response where these cells go and bite or eat out the uh, progenitors of all cell lines so they can come with a pancytopenia however by, by when the when it happens the patients are very very unwell okay uh, and when you do the bone marrow biopsy you will see those hemophagocytes in the bone marrow Okay, so 70-year-old woman who is a known patient with osteoporosis on treatment with alendronate and calcium for two years came with a vertebral fracture. There was further deterioration from the initial DEXA scan. Her lab investigations are as follows. Calcium 1.3, which I suppose is at the upper limit of normal, which is usually 1.32. Phosphate is low, creatinine is normal. PTH is 58, just above the upper limit. What is the next step in the management? Check magnesium, check vitamin D, increase the calcium dose, start solid running, start HRT. Okay, Dhitan. Okay, Dhitan. I love it. Okay, let's break it down. In the first place, this is a 70-year-old lady. She has osteoporosis, worse on alendronate and calcium, but has come with a vertebral fracture. So what does that mean? Alendronate has not worked. 
when you see a patient on bisphosphonates coming with fractures, uh, the first question is, were you actually taking allantrolid compliance? Okay. Uh, so so that, that, that's the that's the common reason for fractures while on allantrolid. If the compliance is fine, then you need to start thinking of a secondary cause. Okay. Now that's a, that's what the second half of the story is talking about. There is deterioration of bone mineral density from the initial excess scan, which means clearly alendronate is not working. Okay. Then in the labs, calcium is fine, but the phosphate is a bit low. Creatinine is normal, PTH is slightly high. Okay. So what could be the biochemical diagnosis here or what is your suspicion? If calcium is up uh, or upper normal and phosphate is low, what does that suggest you of? Ah, very good. Yes, hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> so, if you find a high calcium, first, uh, I mean, you can look at the calcium and phosphate levels. If calcium is high and phosphate is low, that is the hyperparathyroidism pattern. Okay, but if you find calcium is high and the phosphate is also high. That is very unusual to be primary hyperparathyroidism. Then we are thinking of other things like bone breakdown, like cancer metastasis, myeloma, things like that, or vitamin D excess, because vitamin D will increase calcium and it will also increase phosphate. Okay. Uh, and then the other possibility is uh, tertiary hyperparathyroidism in a advanced CKD patient, very rare, but in these people, phosphate is high because the kidneys have failed and phosphate cannot be excreted, mm -hmm. and calcium is high because of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. What is tertiary hyperthyroidism? When someone has a long-standing hypocalcemic state, as in CKD, the PTH will go up. So that is secondary hyperthyroidism. If the parathyroid glands are stimulated and uh, is working hard for a long time, it might become autonomous. And in this stage, the calcium will actually go up. That is tertiary hyperathyroidism. So in CKD people, the first thing to happen is both calcium and phosphate will go down because of inadequate vitamin D activation. In response, the PTH will go up. So that is secondary hyperparathyroidism. At this stage, calcium is still not still normal because it won't allow the calcium to go up because still the feedback loop is intact. If the calcium tries to go up, then the PTH will come down. So it will maintain the balance. But as the disease progresses, the GFR fails and then the phosphate will creep up. And over time, persistent stimulation of the parathyroid glands make them become adenomatous and autonomous. So the feedback loop is lost and this autonomous PTH secretion pushes to a state of tertiary hyperthyroidism and that will cause a high calcium. Okay. So those are the causes of high calcium with high phosphate. Right. Now, uh, when you see high calcium and low phosphate, you are pretty much thinking down the line of primary hyperthyroidism, the next test that you would do is a PTH level. Now, if the PTH, let's say the normal range is given as 10 to 55, let's say if the PTH was 50, how would you interpret it? If the calcium was actually high and the PTH was upper normal, still this is an inappropriately normal PTH, which still suggests of hyperparathyroidism. Because if the feedback loop is intact, if the calcium is high, then the PTH, PTH has to be suppressed. 
if that has not happened then you are thinking of then you are still thinking of primary hyperparathyroidism even though the pth is normal okay all right fine now if you find the pth is high like in this patient how can you be sure that this is actually due to primary hyperparathyroidism because imaging is not 100% reliable sometimes imaging might not pick anything then the next step is to rule out any other problems that can give rise to a similar picture of high calcium low or normal phosphate high or non suppressed pth so what is the other scenario whether this is a secondary hyperparathyroidism okay now this is a bit funny okay because apart from ckd vitamin d deficiency is a very common cause in fact the commonest cause for secondary hyperparathyroidism okay so before you go down the line of hyperparathyroidism evaluation next step will be to check the vitamin d levels and make sure the patient is not vitamin d deficient okay if the patient is deficient then the approach will be to replace the vitamin d and repeat the pth and calcium okay right so once you do that and confirm okay vitamin d is normal still the pth is high okay next step is to rule out the other condition which can mimic similar biochemistry which is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia okay for which you do urine calcium to creatinine ratio okay the very correct terminology will be 24 hour urine calcium creatinine excretion ratio ekem venkara gandone eka eka paavichu karala we can differentiate between primary hyperparathyroidism versus hypocalciuric hypercalcemia because with, with primary hyperparathyroidism the blood calcium will be high and that will be filtered in urine so they will have increased urine calcium in contrast the genetic disease called hypocalciuric hypercalcemia blood calcium is high because the urine is Uh, with, because the kidneys are not removing calcium adequately so they will have low urine calcium so based on this those two can be differentiated okay now at that point you can then come to the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism and if we diagnose it here there is no point doing anything like increasing calcium or starting solid tonic or HRT you need to treat the underlying disease which will be parathyroid operation okay right now is it clear how you would approach a no a high or high normal calcium with low phosphate that is the hyperparathyroid pattern first you do the pth okay it is high then you look at the vitamin d it has to be normal if not replace vitamin d correct the deficiency and repeat pth uh if still the pth is high then you rule out fh by doing the 24 hour urine calcium to get any excretion ratios and if it is confirmed then you consider operation okay a evaluation part ke get no you know the no a uh, few other things to remember primary hyperparathyroidism classically presents in postmenopausal females okay and it is the 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 the, the leading differential diagnosis in this group of people will be metastatic cancer it should be breast cancer or myeloma or anything like that okay Uh, apart from metastases cancers can increase calcium when i say metastases bone metastases calcium can be increased in cancers due to a different mechanism 
what is that mechanism paraneoplastic syndrome which is called humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy when the malignant cells secrete pth related peptide okay its biochemical effects are almost mm. identical to pth so but uh, the 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 catch will be when you do the pth levels it will be very low because the disease is driven by pth related peptide it does not interfere with the lab assays it is not read as pth in lab machines so if the disease is pth related peptide mediated hypercalcemia then the pth will be very low okay similarly uh, in cancer bone metastasis related hypercalcemia because the calcium is high from bone lysis that calcium will have a feedback inhibition on the parathyroid glands and therefore they will have low pth okay <clears throat> hmm. any other questions so uh, just have a look at your notes and revise the extreme manifestations of hypo uh, sorry hyperparathyroidism which can be an mcq why what's the problem with magnesium here magnesium becomes an issue particularly in the setting of hypocalcemia when if you are evaluating hypocalcemia looking at magnesium is the first thing that you would do because low magnesium can cause hypocalcemia because of its effect on calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid glands okay right. any other questions so can you repeat about the magnesium business again yeah so hypomagnesemia mm -hmm. when the magnesium levels are low uh, calcium sensing receptor does not function normally so the parathyroid gland thinks okay the calcium levels are low in uh, sorry calcium levels are high in blood and the pth will be suppressed causing a hypocalcemia okay actually magnesium has a dual effect on the calcium sensing receptor depending on the severity of magnesium deficiency but i don't think you need to know that just remember if the patient is hypocalcemic then you need to rule out hypomagnesemia because it can cause hypocalcemia through calcium sensing receptor dysfunction okay so thank you okay right so uh okay me mukadde me 64 year old lady presented with 10 day history of constipation and abdominal pain on examination there was mild pallor generalized lymphadenopathy and right lower quadrant mass apade mukadde prashna dalade in hypomagnesemia what would be the pth level so uh, P pth level will be low because what happens is when the magnesium level is low calcium sensing receptor does not work normally so the parathyroid cells think okay the uh, calcium sensing receptor is not adequately stimulated which means the blood calcium uh, should be high okay so because the parathyroid gland thinks the blood calcium levels are high it it will suppress the pth release and that drives the hypocalcemia okay uh so 64 year, years 10 days constipation abdominal pain 
माइल फेलो जनरलाइज इंफेनोपैथी राइट लोअर क्वाड्रेंट मैस देयर वाज नो हेपेटोस्प्लेनो मेगली व्हिच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग फाइंडिंग्स मेक द डायग्नोसिस ऑफ टाइफाइड अनलाइकली ओके एब्सेंस ऑफ स्प्लेनो मेगली कॉन्स्टिपेशन जनरलाइज इंफेनोपैथी फेलो राइट आइलियक फोसा मैस हाय ओह uh. राइट मैस ओके ओके दैट्स गुड सी वेरी नाइस जनरलाइज ओके परसेंटेज देन Actually, trying to find what percentage of typhoid patients get generalized lymphadenopathy, because that's 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 not unheard of. Okay, generalized lymphadenopathy. right anyway never mind i can't find the percentages but that's okay so uh, absence of splenomegaly now splenomegaly is a very characteristic feature of typhoid this usually appears by around 5 to 7 days into the illness okay so by day 10 uh, not having splenomegaly is a bit of a concern but having said that this is not a universal feature okay uh, i wouldn't say absence of splenomegaly rules out typhoid but 
I mean, I would generally think that if splenomegaly is not there, I will doubt the diagnosis of typhoid, but then I'm not very sure of this, okay? Constipation. So, presence of constipation will definitely not make typhoid unlikely because it is a very well-known feature, okay? At least in the early days of the disease. So, B is out. A generalized lymphadenopathy uh, is known to occur in typhoid, okay? So, if I find generalized lymphadenopathy, I will not think, okay, because of lymphadenopathy, this is not going to be typhoid. So, I should not be thinking like that. Pallor is rather non-specific, isn't it? 10 days of illness, probably not long enough to develop anemia of chronic disease or something like that. We might have bits of abdominal ulcers and things like that. Maybe a little later in the disease. So I'm not confident to say because she is pale, this is not typhoid. Okay, this is this is a very non-specific physical sign. Now, right iliac fossa is a very concerning physical sign, okay? Uh, why would I think? So, uh, how can, can typhoid cause a right iliac fossa mass? Well, typhoid is known to cause abscesses, okay? But this is a very, very, very rare complication. Okay, and if this was an abscess, it has to be a very tender abscess with a very unwell patient. Okay, and usually these sort of complications, uh, like bowel perforations, hemorrhages, over hemorrhages, abscesses tend to happen towards the late second week, third week of the illness. Okay. So when I see this patient 10 days into illness, okay, and doesn't seem to be exquisitely septic or unwell based on what is mentioned, okay, having a right iliac fossa mass, I am much more worried about a malignant mass than typhoid, okay. So for me, right iliac fossa mass is probably uh, what worries me a lot and tells me that this is probably not typhoid, but something like cancer, okay? But I don't personally think this is a very clear-cut answer. People can argue this way or other. I don't know what was taken as the correct answer, to be honest. But my answer will be E. Okay. But my next close answer will be A and the next close will be C. D is too vague to be definitive. Okay. Right. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? No questions. 54-year-old, diagnosed patient with diabetes, presented with fever, dry cough, frontal headache and myalgia. On examination, he has a pulse rate of 110 and temperature of 102. Lungs were clear. White cells 12.2, chutakwadi, lymphocytic 53%, platelets low normal. What is the most likely causative organism? Dengue, influenza, lepto, salmonella, typhi, streptococcus. Day 5 illness, dengue, and pulu and the mega. Usually by this stage, whether you leak or not, I would expect a 
a lower white cell count, okay, and platelets possibly a bit lower than this. I mean, if they don't leak, they might come down to around 190 by this time and then go up. Uh, but but it's a bit less likely. And of course, things like dry cough are not so classic of dengue. Influenza when you on the maker. Influenza like syndrome the present fever, dry cough, frontal headache, myalgia, classic influenza like illness. And uh, lungs are clear, which very well can happen. White cells, yes, lymphocytic. I mean, that sounds a very reasonable answer. And influenza is a very, fairly a common respiratory illness. Diabetes is a risk factor for influenza, so that looks like a good, nice answer. Leptospira, day five of illness, I would expect a strong neutrophilia, which is not there. So that's probably out. Salmonella typhi, it does come with dry cough, it does come with frontal headache. Hmm. Uh, but it's probably less common than influenza. There is no discussion about bowel symptoms. Uh, and it no, no mention of splenomegaly or anything like that. So probably it becomes a second possibility than a first possibility like influenza. Streptococcus pneumonia. Again, I would expect a neutrophilia and some lung signs of a lobe consolidation. Neither. So, influenza looks like the best bet for me. Does anyone have different thoughts? Mm. No. So, <clears throat> if you come across a fairly uh, acute few days of dry cough, fever, headache, the influenza like syndrome, you need to think of viral infections, including influenza and COVID and all that sort of stuff. But also, don't, don't forget mycoplasma and Legionella. Okay, I'll come back to that shortly. Uh, the other entity that you need to know is uh, the other uh, IMN like illness, influence, sorry, uh, infectious mononucleosis like illness, where the clinical picture is dominated by a few days of fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly. So, EBV is the classic cause for IMN, uh, but CMV can also cause a IMN like illness. HIV zero conversion is also an IMN like illness. Don't forget the parasitic infections like toxoplasmosis and typhoid uh, in, in the differential diagnosis. In mycoplasma in Legionella, again, I put that then again. I think this is probably a bit too much for you all, but I'll tell you all what's important. Okay. So, uh, I think this is a common MCQ. Legionella is classically associated with hyponatremia, confusion, and muscle injury. Okay. Mycoplasma can cause a whole heap of autoimmune manifestations. I suppose the common questions are called IHA, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay. Right. Inflammatory markers are high. Remember this. In mycoplasma, oftentimes, the white cells and differential count is normal. Whereas Legionella, most of the time, they would have a neutrophil leukocytosis. Okay. Then, uh, the diagnosis for Legionella is the urine test for Legionella and pigeon. Mycoplasma diagnosis is with antibodies in blood. Okay.
and the x-ray can be a lot of things in mycoplasma and from lobe pneumonia to bronchopneumonia to just uh, more diffuse atelectasis type of picture. Legion LS class will like alveolar infections. Okay. Any questions? Balam, 16 year old boy presents with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. He has taken four tablets of paracetamol four hourly during the last 36 hours for a toothache. He presented with nausea, vomiting, right hyperbolic tenderness, the hyperacula. Plasma paracetamol level was measured and it was below the treatment threshold. What is the next step in management? Reassure activated charcoal. Repeat blood serum paracetamol level in nomogram in four hours. Start next, start methylene. Any different answers? D, what am I going to do? Okay, very good. Yes, so this is a staggered overdose. Now, Runakmati nomogram can be applied for an acute overdose, not for a staggered overdose. And when you apply Runakmati nomogram, the time you have to count is from the time of ingestion. So if you have taken multiple ingestions, then you do not know where to calculate the time. So that's one problem. But the bigger problem is it is developed by studying people who came with acute overdoses and this cannot be applied for staggered overdoses. Okay. Now how do you decide in a, someone with staggered overdose? Well, the other thing is uh, Rumagmatheum nomogram is available only from 4 hours to up to 24 hours. If you look at some, if you just Google it, you might find... Sorry. So, if you Google it, sometimes you might find graphs which extend these lines up to 36 hours or 48 hours. But then this is the original graph, which is only from 4 hours to 24 hours. Okay. Right. Now, in staggered overdose, if the paracetamol uh, level is above the therapeutic level, so this is not a toxicology level, this is a therapeutic level. If the paracetamol level is super therapeutic, then we could imagine this is likely to have a high risk of toxicity. Alternatively, if you fairly accurately know the dose, and if you know if the 24 hour cumulative dose is more than seven and a half, then it's an indication. Or else, if there is clinical evidence or biochemical evidence of hepatitis, that's also an indication to give NAC. Okay. Why can't you give methionine? Because it has to be given within the first eight hours from ingestion and it has no place in staggered overdose. Charcoal then calling and done. Now it's too late. Uh, reassuring is dangerous with this level of staggered toxicity. Okay, right. So if someone asks me why are you giving this individual another uh, NAC, so I mean I can if necessary do calculate the total dose, but it's very likely to be high. But even without that, no CR vomiting, right hypochondriac tenderness is clinical evidence of hepatitis. So that alone is good enough to give a uh, neck. Okay. And how long are you going to give neck? You will follow the standard protocol. And in the you will continue the last infusion rate until hepatitis is resolved.
Now, uh, this is how paracetamol is metabolized. Acet acetaminophen is the American name for paracetamol. It is conjugated in the liver to sulfates and glucuronides. Some of it is oxidized to NAPQI, which is the toxic substance. NAPQI is, is removed by glutathione, and NAC is a resource of a source of glutathione. Now tell me what is the effect of alcohol, chronic alcohol consumption? Uh, are chronic alcoholics at increased risk of paracetamol toxicity or are they at decreased risk? Chronic alcohol? risk of paracetamol toxicity. <clears throat> so you have two adults, same age, same sex. One is a long-term long alcohol consumer. Other one is a teetotaler. They both take the same overdose of paracetamol. Who has the higher risk of developing paracetamol toxicity? Yeah. Right. T totally has a higher risk of paracetamol toxicity. Okay. Any different answers? What's the effect of alcohol on P450? Right, in the sense. So, the effect is different in acute alcohol ingestion and chronic alcohol consumption. With acute dose of alcohol or acute bout of alcohol consumption, it will actually inhibit or suppress T450. E I is one. Okay. Therefore, if someone takes paracetamol overdose with a good bout of alcohol, their P450 will be suppressed and also alcohol will compete with paracetamol to be oxidized through this pathway. So the excess paracetamol will be diverted to conjugation rather than to oxidation. And therefore, the acute alcohol consumption with the paracetamol excess will reduce the risk of paracetamol toxicity. But in contrast, long-term alcohol use actually induces P452 VI. Okay. Now, therefore, someone who is a chronic alcohol consumer, if they take acetaminophen, they have highly activated P450 system. So the paracetamol will be diverted in this direction. Okay. And chronic alcoholics also have a depleted glutathione reserve. So they are very vulnerable to accumulation of toxic NEPQI. And then they are at higher risk of developing toxicity. And that is why alcoholics or chronic alcoholics are considered to be a high risk group to develop uh, paracetamol toxicity. But if they, this, this was an MCQ when we did finals, I can't remember what the exact MCQ was. 
just in simple terms, acute alcohol taken with paracetamol overdose will decrease the risk of toxicity, but chronic alcoholics are at higher risk of paracetamol toxicity. Okay. Any questions? No questions. Hi. 24-year-old woman on multiple drugs for psychiatric illness was brought to the hospital by her family members with suspected poisoning that had occurred about two hours ago. He was severely drowsy and saturation was 84, pulse 110, blood pressure 9 to 60. What is the most appropriate next step? Charcoal, intubation, gastric lavage, induced vomiting, non-invasive, positive pressure ventilation. Why is he hypoxic? Most likely, he would have aspirated because he's very drowsy and then he would have developed an aspiration pneumonitis. Probably a bit too early to develop pneumonia, but early enough. I mean, aspiration pneumonitis is instantaneous. If you have aspirated enough amount of gastric content, that would have caused an aspiration pneumonitis. Okay, right. And activated charcoal, probably too late at two hours. Same with gastric lavage. Uh, induced vomiting should not be tried with a drowsy patient because he's going to aspirate again. Okay. Uh, saturation is low. Saturation alone, we might be able to handle with some supplement the oxygen through face mask or whatever that is. But in the context of being severely drowsy, there is a threat to his airway as well. Okay. So airway has to be protected. Oxygenation has to be improved. And even hemodynamics seems to be a bit unstable. Okay. So he seems to be ill enough and respiratory system seems to be compromised enough for him to require mechanical ventilation. And therefore, he will need endotracheal intubation. Okay? So the key reason that pushes our decision to intubation is the fact that he is very drowsy. Okay? We generally tend to think GCS of less than 8. Patient is unable to maintain the airway. So is a candidate for mechanical ventilation, okay? We cannot try non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in a severely drowsy patient because we need the patient to be able to maintain the airway patent and breathe normally, okay? I think he is too drowsy to do either of those. Okay, any questions? No questions. 40 year old fisherman from Jaffna presented with snake bite envenomation uh, on his right foot three hours ago. Got the crush name. Induced vomiting in toxicity is actually no longer practiced. This was an older practice. So if this appears in an MCQ, it is very, very likely to be false. Okay, or if it is a single best response, it's very likely to be a wrong answer. Okay, okay. there was swelling at the there was swelling at the bite side, so there is some local reaction. There was no overbleeding, but 20 minute WBCT is prolonged. So there is some amount of coagulopathy. Neurology is fine at the moment. What is the most likely snake that he had got bitten by? Cow then. Eekhi and cow then? So scaled viper. Any different answers? Very good, yes. Okay. 
So, uh, saw scale viper is known to hide in sand, nil. And then, if, if you see a coagulopathy, okay, if you see a coagulopathy, that is going to be a viper. Okay. By the way, have you all seen the new guideline in 2021? So, it might not be new to you all, but it's definitely new to me. If you Google, I think this is SLMA, uh, the guidelines were updated in 2021. And this is from that guideline. This is a very, very nice screenshot. Okay. You need to know all of this. Okay. If there is something that you can afford to forget, that might be green pit wiper. But then it is identical to hump nose wipers manifestation so there is nothing much to worry about so if you see here coagulopathy if you see coagulopathy it's a viper okay if you see neurotoxicity it's a non viper except russell's viper okay so russell's viper is the only snake to cause all three problems local effect coagulopathy neurotoxicity that's the first thing to remember. Then you remember coagulopathies are on, only seen by seen in vipers, and neurotoxicities are only seen with non-vipers. But we all would know Russell's viper can cause neurotoxicity. Okay, and sea snake is classically a muscle toxicity snake. You don't see anything else. Someone comes from the sea and he is in rhabdomyolysis. Then you think of sea snake viper. Sorry, sir, sea snake bite. And then you need to know these uh, contexts, which is sometimes handy, like this one, so scaled viper, sandy, arid coastal plains, Jaffna vegetable farmers, bites on leaves. That's fairly straightforward. There is no other way to answer a snake bite question without knowing these. And then you need to know we the 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 Anti-venom we use can be used against four snakes. Neither. This is the top four. Russell's Cobra Crate Saw Scale. Okay. 34 year old school teacher who is being followed up at the rheumatology clinic for a small joint arthritis presents with new onset rash for two weeks. So, has had arthritis, small joint arthritis for some time and is now coming with a rash of new onset. On examination, there is a well defined erythematous rash on the extensor surfaces of bilateral upper and lower limbs. Sorry, bilateral upper limbs and Back of the scalp, just below the hairline. On inquiry, she ignore the 16. That's the page number, I think, when I copied. On inquiry, she states that the rash is sometimes itchy and parts of it scales off. What's the unifying diagnosis? Let's see neither. Yes, absolutely. Psoriatic arthritis. So this <coughs> description of rash is characteristic of psoriatic rash because it is erythematous. Okay. And uh, it's on extensor surfaces. Okay. And scalp rash that crosses hairline is psoriasis. Right. Then the scaling, again, characteristic of psoriasis. Sometimes psoriatic rash is itchy, sometimes it is not. So all of this description matches with psoriasis. Can psoriatic arthritis start before the psoriatic rash 
Yes, it can. Okay. What is the commonest type of arthritis in psoriasis? It's the small joint rheumatoid like arthritis. Okay. Small joint rheumatoid like arthritis, including the deformities of rheumatoid. Okay. It's the commonest type of arthritis in psoriasis. Okay. There are four other types of arthritis, including the classic distal interphalangeal joint psoriatic arthritis which affects the DIPs okay then the, the spondyloarthritis of psoriasis then the last one is the arthritis mutilans the other one is mono or oligoarthritis of large joints okay of all the, the commonest is rheumatoid like arthritis of hands and if in other words if you see rheumatoid like hands then your diagnosis number one is rheumatoid arthritis but number two to exclude will be psoriatic arthritis and most of the people with rheumatoid like psoriatic arthritis will have psoriatic nail changes even though they do not have skin rash so look for nail pitting and things like that okay fine sclerodoma wala meyage rash it is sclerosis of the skin okay right so this chart is actually more useful for a long case scenario which i know is not relevant for you all now but uh, particularly these questions like how do you differ if someone says pain around joints how do you know if it is articular or is it extra articular like rise from ligament to tendon so you can look at these you can probably afford not to worry too much about acute arthritis but among chronic arthritis the next question is is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory Features that suggest inflammatory type arthritis is early morning stiffness, which relieves and pain is worse at rest and relieves with activity. Then the constitutional symptoms, soft tissue swelling around the joint and high inflammatory markers. Okay. Any questions? So don't worry about any of these. This is peripheral spondyloarthropathy, tuberculosis, adult onset stills disease. Don't worry. Reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid bacillus, sarcoid, psoriatic arthritis, systemic sclerosis, hereditary hemochromatosis, primary biliary cholangitis, reactive arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, triglobulinemia. Totally ignore number five here. Okay. Right. Randomized control trial of drug X was conducted with 320 participants to ascertain whether it reduce, reduced mortality. 120 received the drug and 24 died. The 72 of 240 who received the placebo died. Okay. What is the number needed to treat of this drug to reduce one death? Hi. Now let's convert this into percentages. 120 received treatment, 24 died. So what is the mortality rate in drug group? Okay, so we see that the other one is the other one. The other one is the other one. 
So mortality rate among drug users uh, is 20%. 72 out of 240 can 30% of placebo group died. Okay. By giving the drug, you have reduced the number of deaths from 30 to 20 among 100 users. So, in other words, if you treat 100 people, you will prevent 10 deaths. Okay. So to prevent one death, how many will you have to treat? To prevent 10 deaths, you have to treat 100. To prevent one death, you will have to treat how many? The high in either. You can see in either. Should I repeat that? Okay, no need to repeat. So NNT is probably the commonest research question that is asked, which is very easy. So, I mean, either you can remember the technical definition, which I can't remember, uh, something you calculate the absolute risk reduction, and then I think it's inverse or something like that. But it's simple, sir. Number needed to treat to prevent one death is just what it means. 30 not treated died, 20 treated died out of 100. So if you treat 100 people, you will prevent 10 deaths. If you want to prevent one death, what's the number that you should treat? Okay. Apart from that, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, relative risk, odds ratio are the other things that you might have to calculate. So sensitivity, specificity, PPV and PV come in relation to diagnostic tests. In this question, 320 participants, is it a mystery? Oh, 120 plus 240. 320 participants, Oh, no, 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 no. So the, the total sample size was 320. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a mistake. It has to be 360, neither. So there were 120 in the treatment arm and 240 in the placebo arm. Very good observation. Yes, so it has to be 360 participants were included. Okay. Does anyone have any questions in relation to that? No, yes, very good point, uh, but it, 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 it seems to be a typing mistake, okay. So sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive, well inside relation to diagnostic tests, okay. So you will have to remember some way to find, a, find some way to remember what each of these means and should be able to calculate these things based on the given data. I will suggest if you have a diagnostic test related question, you must draw the 4 by 4 table, then life becomes very easy. Okay, And carefully read the question to fill up the cages and then calculate the missing cages. Always cross check that your totals are right in across rows and across columns, okay? Because the commonest reason for you to get this wrong is not because you do not know the, the definitions of these terms, but because you fill the cages wrong. Okay, so that is my tip. Okay.
45 year old female presented to the dermatology clinic with right wrist drop and a hypopigmented patch over the forearm which she was for which she was started on rifampicin one month late so what do you think the diagnosis is leprosy very good are you able to say whether it is tuberculosis leprosy or lepromatous leprosy tuberculosis leprosy sir yes tuberculosis leprosy because it's only one skin lesion neither and it doesn't seem to have the full picture of uh, lepromatous leprosy okay i'll come to that one month later she again came with erythema and induration of the previous lesions severe pain and worsening of the weakness what is the most likely reason for her current complaint cellulitis delayed hypersensitivity drug eruption herpes zoster thrombophlebitis okay the uttar yes very good then uh, it seems the problem is whatever that was there has got worse there is no reason why a cellulitis would worsen the weakness okay if it was a drug eruption it should not just be worsening of the previous rash but there should be new lesions okay Herpes zoster, you know, it's different. It's a dermatomal thing, not on the lesion that she had. Um, and thrombophlebitis again <clears throat> will not cause worsening. I mean, any of the other diagnoses will not cause worsening of the weakness. So, what is delayed hypersensitivity reaction? So you remember the classification of hypersensitive reactions type 1 2 3 4 4 which one is also known as delayed hypersensitivity reaction type 1 type 1 yeah type 4 okay okay so uh, just look at the types of hypersensitivity reactions delayed hypersensitivity is type 4 Okay. Now, people with leprosy, okay, can get what is called lepra reactions. This is classified as type one reaction and type two reaction. Type two reaction is also known as erythema nodosum leprosy. Right now, forget about the middle three columns. you don't need to know about borderline leprosy okay but you need to know about tt or tuberculoid leprosy and ll which is lepromatous leprosy okay now if you look at the disease itself the leprosy itself forget about the reactions for a moment these individuals have a very strong cell mediated immune response okay therefore they contain the infection manifestations are limited to one or very few skin lesions okay they will have some nerve thickening and few nerves being affected okay and if you touch the nerve you feel it granular because of the uh, uh, granular okay now in contrast if someone has a weak T helper type one response and a more T helper two response, then the ability to form granuloma is weak. So then the the bacilli are not contained to few lesions, but they are there will be many. So they will have a lot of skin lesions. They will have uh, <clears throat> a lot of nerve thickening. They will have some visceral manifestations like. Uh, nasal bridge collapse epistaxis 
peripheral neuropathy, multiple nerves affected, and things like that. Hypoadrenalism. Okay. okay. So that's a poor granuloma formation, strong granuloma formation. Okay. Now, theoretically, if someone is at this end of the spectrum with good cell mediated immune response, they will not get reactions. They don't get reactions. Okay. Borderline ones will get reactions. Lepromatous leprosy, so at this end of the spectrum, they are more likely to get a type 2 lepra reaction. Remember, type 2 lepra reaction does not mean type 2 hypersensitivity syndrome. Okay. So type 2 lepra reaction is actually a type 3 hypersensitivity response. Whereas type 1 lepra reaction is a type 4 hypersensitivity response. And what happens is, in this type of a response, existing lesions worsen. Or in other words, they become more red. And because of the worsening inflammation at the nerves, there can be worsening neurological dysfunction. Okay. In contrast, in type 3 hypersensitivity response, it's like a vasculitis or a systemic illness. So they get lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, erythema nodosum, okay. Then nerves become tender, dactylitis, iritis, eye issues, all sorts of things. Okay. So reactions can happen, reactions typically happen when you start on treatment and bacilli are killed and the antigens are released, okay? But reactions can happen even without you starting treatment, okay? In other words, erythema nodosum leprosum might be the presentation of lepromatous leprosy. Okay? A type 4 hypersensitive reaction might be what brings the patient with borderline tuberculoid leprosy to medical attention. So typically happens after treatment is initiated, but it can happen even before that. Okay. And the other thing you need to remember is tuberculoid leprosy is often treated with uh, dapsone and rifampicin, and lepromatous leprosy needs additional treatment with clofacin. Please ignore the middle three columns. You don't need to worry about it. Okay. So strictly speaking, the patient in the MCQ, the best answer would be he would have had a borderline tuberculoid leprosy. Okay. Because in full tuberculoid leprosy, you will not see a reaction. Okay. But don't worry about that. You will not be questioned on that. You need to be able to recognize the reactions and know the type of hypersensitivity response. Hi. 79 year old man presented with multiple lechemotic patches. He had multiple. Co oh, sorry. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Seventy-nine men, multiple lechemotic patches, had multiple comorbidities, was on statin, aspirin for ischemic heart disease, warfarin for AF, enolapril, nifidipine for hypertension, and diabetes tablets. Took antibiotics recently for an upper respiratory infection. Again, ignore seventeen. It's from the page number. What is the investigation that is most likely to reveal cause for her for the bleeding? Full blood count, blood urea, APTT, PTINR, fibrinogen level. What is the most likely cause for bleeding? Okay, well, what's the answer here? Yeah. 
Very good, yes. So this is fairly a common scenario. Uh, upper respiratory tract infection antibiotic, probably something like macrolide, which inhibited the P450 system. This will reduce the warfarin breakdown or metabolism. So then this would have caused the warfarin toxicity. And the way to diagnose warfarin toxicity is to look at the INR and to show that it is supertherapeutic. Okay. Easy. So that's it. Any questions? Hello. <clears throat> no questions. Ah, no more. Ah, make it now. Uttari, mama, thamma dhanni ne. Why is warfarin given at evening time? Is is there a specific reason? Well, as far as I know, it has to be. It's it's best to take at the same time to avoid forgetting it and make it a routine. And then you have to find a time where it, uh, where the timing is least interfered with food. Okay. So probably you catch the best gap somewhere in the evening time between the lunch and dinner rather than in the morning hours. Okay. Now that's the best I know. As far as I know, there is no molecular level reason. Okay. Do we use dextran over crystalloids in DHF with pulmonary edema? Uh, well, yes, I would say presence of pulmonary edema. So it's like this. Why would someone in with dengue develop pulmonary edema? There could be two reasons. One is previously held individual, okay? was given too much fluids during the leaking phase and then in the reabsorption phase they become their hearts are overloaded which causes pulmonary edema okay so at this so there there might be a state where the patient is uh, still within the critical phase okay but the fluid reabsorption has commenced and has gone into uh, a pulmonary edema. Okay. So in this scenario, say there, uh, there is some amount of leak still going on, but there is reabsorption also happening. Okay. So in this, this sort of a scenario, your preferred volume replacement would be dextrin. Okay. It, it, it's, a, it's a bit theoretical there. Uh, but the common scenario might be someone who already has a heart disease, okay, uh, going into heart failure because we have given too much of fluids and the patient is still in the leaking phase, okay. So in this case, there is some amount of pulmonary congestion, but there is generalized hypovolemia as well because of leakage. Now, this is very tricky. You need to give fluids to maintain intravascular volume to avoid hypotension and shock, but you shouldn't be giving too much so that the pulmonary edema worsens. So, in this scenario, you would prefer to give a colloid which remains within the vascular system to maintain volume. Okay. Now, remember, colloids should never be used as an infusion. Okay. It has to be a bolus because when you infuse, give it as a slow infusion, the colloid will also break down or disintegrate and it will also leak through the capillaries. Okay, So get that context right. You are talking about a patient with pulmonary edema who is also volume depleted and going towards shock. Then you are treating with 
a dextran bonus. Okay, so that, that's the context. But if the patient is out of the critical phase, then then you probably try to give minimum fluids that are needed. But if you feel the patient is still hypotensive and intravascular collapses there in ultrasound scan of the IVC or whatever that is, then you can replace with dextra. Okay. Any other questions? Some time back, someone asked about internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Okay. Uh, I suspect this is a bit too late to answer that question. Probably the interest would have been more with clinicals. So from an MCQ standpoint, all you need to be able to do is to recognize this is INO by the description of physical science if that is given. Okay. And then to remember the two important causes of INO. One is stroke, the other one is uh, MSK and multiple sclerosis. Okay. Uh, Right, so if I just try to quickly catch on this, if you want to look at, so see if this person wants to look to his left, right, his left eye should turn to left, his right eye should turn to left, his left eye should abduct, his right eye should adduct. Abduction is done by the sixth nerve, LR6, adduction is done by the third nerve. So if someone wants to look to left, his left sixth nerve should fire and his right third nerve should fire. Okay, So this is coordinated through a connection between six and three nuclei and the fibers run from six to third in a bundle called medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay. Now imagine if the and and the point to remember here is these fibers cross to the other side at the lower level, at the level of the sixth nerve, and take the message to the third nerve on the other side. Right. Cross at the level of the sixth nerve and then go up to the third nerve. <clears throat> so say if someone has right side medial longitudinal fasciculus damaged and he is trying to look to the left. Okay. So the message will come to the gaze center or PPRF from the cortex or wherever and the message will go through the sixth nerve appropriately to the left side, left eye and the left eye will adduct, sorry, abduct, left eye will abduct. But that message does not go up from the gaze center to the third nerve of the right eye. So the right eye will not adduct. Now, when this happens, brain recognizes that two eyes are giving two different images, okay? And will give repeated messages to the PPRF to bring, to, to, to make this movement. So then what happens with, is that the left eye will go into a nystagmus. And the right eye will just remain the same because the PPRF is firing, asking the third nerve to turn to this side, but the message does not go there. 
So in effect, what will happen is when someone is asked to look to the left and if he has a right-sided MLF lesion, the right eye will fail to adduct and left eye will abduct and go into an nystagmus. Okay. So the side of the lesion is the side where adduction failure exists. Okay. So if you remember that, okay, so someone has nystagmus on one side and adduction failure on the other side, diagnosis is INO and the lesion is on the side of the adduction failure. Okay, that you need to remember. And then you need to remember two causes, uh, stroke and uh, multiple sclerosis. HRI. Any more questions? Right. How long does it take to increase hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter? Uh, in other words, I remember with 3 weeks of adequate iron treatment, hemoglobin will go up by 2. Pardon Okay. Is there a difference of time if we give IV iron to the patient? Okay. Uh, okay, Kian me. IV iron will replenish the stores faster. Replenish the stores, iron stores faster than oral iron. But as far as I remember, there is no difference in the speed of uh, HB improvement. Okay. Uh, this was there in Hofbrand, which I don't have with me. So perhaps the best thing would be to look at iron deficiency anemia treatment section in essential hematology Hofbrand. Okay. Any other questions? Hari, okay. I think that's about it. Mm, all the very best. I'm sure you all will do well. Make sure you mark all the SBRs and make sure you take care when you mark the true or false. If you still have any questions, do send them across to me. You can send it to Amanta who can send it to me. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Right.